Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Um, this one's going to be great. Uh, the guy that I have on, Will Grazion, if you guys are not familiar with him, um, he is the CEO owner of The Educated Dieter. Um, he has a bachelor's uh, degree in exercise science. Um, he's also a pro natural bodybuilder. And on top of all that, he's a friend. He's a great guy. I've known Will for a long time. And it's actually, we're going to kind of get into Will's backstory a little bit. And there's, there's a lot of overlap between him and I before him and I even met that we learned later on in uh, developing our, our, our friendship, our relationship over the years. So, Will, thank you for taking the time to come on and sharing your knowledge with us and having a little discussion. Hey, David, it's always a pleasure, man. You know, obviously, I've, I've paid attention to Will, what you've been up to moving back home acquiring a beautiful home on amazing property and obviously i've known you for a very long time all the way back to the university of south florida days with doc, doc dr campbell and being i think the first bio lane coach when he decided to expand his team and stuff like that so uh it was only a matter of time before this happened and obviously i'm very grateful to have the opportunity to chat with you and uh by the way i love your hat <laughs> oh, i appreciate it i appreciate it man so you know, I kind of alluded to that we we are have a friendship, we have a history. Um, you have a very interesting, compelling, inspirational journey to from where you started to where you are now. Now, I know quite a bit of the background of it, but I'm sure as you talk about it, I'm going to learn a little bit more that maybe I haven't even known before. But sure. just a general sense, um, you know, I used to live in St. Petersburg, Florida which Will used to live in St. Petersburg, Florida. And this was before him and I ever met. Um, we didn't learn this until later on, but he was actually a janitor at the gym that I trained at. Um, and setting up that background, I'm going to let you run with the story and talk about <laughs> where you started and how you got to be the CEO for the last decade or so of the Educated Dieter. Um, because it's a really, really fascinating story. Yeah, you know what, David? There's been so many amazing life transformations and transitions that have occurred ever since then. First and foremost, I just want to, you know, obviously highlight the fact that I don't believe I'd be where I am today without my faith, without Amen. my belief in Jesus Christ, without my belief in God. Ultimately, knowing that whenever I face hard challenges in my life, that I'm supported, I have a wall to lean against. I'm not going to fall. I'm going to stand. I'm going to be resilient. And if we take it all the way back to Gold's Gym days, you know, there was actually quite a few people that used to train out of that gym. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jacob Wilson, you trained out of there. Ben Pakulski used to train out of there. Uh, two time natural Olympia champion Rob Terry. Like, there was a lot of really good people that trained out of that gym whereas back in 2008 2009 like nobody knew what online coaching was you oh, know what no. i mean and uh it's really cool I always to see people, where people are now i always tell people like when i first started getting into like lifting and bodybuilding i mean i'm maybe 40 this year um mm -hmm. i was picking up magazines off the shelf still mm -hmm. like, yeah. none of the information that we have today was around when you and i started yeah Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, taking it back to Gold's Gym, um, it was a sad day when they tore that gym down. I will tell you that. But um, I graduated with, with my bachelor's in uh, exercise science. Um, I went to college in Oklahoma. It was a small Chris Christian college. Um, they allowed me to play football there for four years. I loved it. Uh, growing up, I was always an athlete. And even while I was a football player, um, people told me that I should consider a bodybuilding and I'm like I'm not a bodybuilder you know I'm a football player and when I graduated I didn't know what was next for me um, so I went back home um, I began to research into what would it look like to go get my master's degree in physical therapy or something like that and this was before Dr. Campbell even started his program at the University of South Florida so I was kind of limited in terms of the direction that I had at the time and I just said, well, this is the job that I had while I was, uh, you know, going through my four years of academia. Like, let me just go back to the gym, get a job as a janitor while I figure everything out, while I try to find my path, you know, for the next, you know, five to 10 years. Because in all honesty, I didn't know uh, what I was going to be doing. I tapped into, you know, law enforcement. I tapped into 
personal training. Um, I tapped into being a martial arts instructor and I was just looking for the, that next thing. Um, right. You know, I realized because I was always very interested in education, um, you know, even to the point where like my professors in college would get upset with me because I would be asking them the questions that they didn't have the answers to. So I was always very guy. interested in bodybuilding and losing body fat and doing those things. But the program back then just didn't exist anywhere, you know, and obviously very grateful that people like Dr. Campbell and Lane have education platforms like they have now. But back then, these things didn't exist because I can guarantee you if it did exist back then, I would have been over there. I'd have been right. in there. I'd have been doing it. Um, but I just kind of think, you know, God, the universe, it just kind of aligned me. And it made me go through some challenging times, uh, maybe being a janitor, you know, cleaning the toilets every day, uh, doing all the grunt work that still allows me to this day, I still find passion and purpose in doing the grunt work. You know what I mean? And I'm never, I'm never at a position where I can't get down and clean something or do the thing that maybe some people would look at as being something that's not necessary. But I think that ultimately is kind of what puts you in the position to be a leader is knowing that nothing's ever above you, right? And you're continuing to move forward in your life. But again, nothing is ever, you know, you're, you're never beyond anything, any one specific thing. Um, yeah. And so I started as, as the janitor. Um, and basically what I learned was that a lot of personal trainer clients of trainers that I knew had a lot of questions. And I would just listen, man. I'd go to work with no headphones on and I would just listen to people talk and communicate. And I remember listening to the personal trainers give their clients advice. And I would say, man, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would they tell them to diet that way? Why would they tell them to train that way? Why are they training them this, this way? And whatever questions I would acquire, I would go home. At the time, I was living at my mom's house, um, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. I was living at, at my mom's and I would go home, lock myself in my bedroom. And I would just scour the internet, scour scientific research, trying to find the answers. So that way, the next day when I showed up to, to the gym, I could find that same person and I could say, hey, you know, I heard you yesterday asking about this thing. I just want to let you know I found you the answer. And the answer is this. And they're like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. And it got to the point where people started to come to the janitor asking me the questions. That's versus awesome. asking the trainer the questions. Let me and ask I, you real quick. I, I, I mean, yeah, uh, sure. Go ahead. Did that? How did that go over with with the other trainers? Because I because yeah, I mean so, you and I both know we've been trainers before, and if someone comes and talks to my client about something I'm you know something else that I'm telling them, that's that's turf you don't want to step on. So how did that relationship go with the other trainers there? You know what I think it was. Uh, David was more of just like a mutual respect inside the gym that the trainers knew that I knew what I was talking about. Um, because around the same time, I had actually just won the overall at my very first bodybuilding show. And so when I came back being the janitor, but I was, you know, I had just won an overall at a bodybuilding show using very untraditional methods of body transformation. Um, right. people started to ask me questions, even like the guys that were bodybuilders, like, how did you get that lean being natural, eating the stuff that you were eating, not doing three hours of cardio a day, you know, like, like, how did you do it? And in that moment of time, like, I remember I sat, I sat there and I was like, all right, well, number one, like, it's clear that I've learned a few things, you know, from whether it be from academia or whether it be from the work that I did on my own, trying to find the real answers for people. Mm -hmm. It's clear that I'm providing value to a facility and I'm getting absolutely nothing in return. I'm just giving value for free at this yes. point. Right. And I'll just, yeah. I just wanted to help people. And um, the way that it transitioned was I had won the bodybuilding show. And then people that were in the gym that were bodybuilders started to ask me to help guide them into their competition. Because they're like, Will, if you could if you could do it and you could guide you could guide yourself to an overall in your first show, could you help me? And I was like, Yeah, let's do it. And I remember working with about fifteen clients for free. I didn't charge yeah. anybody anything for, for probably I mean close to 
probably six to eight months before I remember walking into the general manager's office and basically telling him that I could be the best personal trainer that this gym's ever seen. Mm -hmm. I had just built a confidence at that point. I'm like, I had already helped three people turn pro. Um, whatever clients I had in shows, they were winning the shows. And I'm like, why am I the janitor? Like, I people are coming to me asking me questions. I need to level up my own confidence in what I'm doing. And one day, I just I was in the I was, I was in the gym, and you know, you get that big uh, Ghostbuster vacuum pack on, and I'm oh, in yeah. the gym, and I'm like vacuuming yep. up the floors, going under the the dumbbell racks and the benches and all that stuff. And I just had this idea. I'm like, you could be the best trainer in this gym. What are you doing? And I said, and I literally took it off, dropped it. And I walked into the general manager's office. His name was, his name was Mike. And I said, Hey, Mike, I want to talk to you about becoming a personal trainer for Gold's Gym. And he mm -hmm. said, okay, William. He said, well, you got one minute to explain why you should be a trainer at this gym. And I was like, deal. And I just spewed it out, man. It was all passion. It was all heart. It was all look at what I've done. It was all I've been helping the, the gym and the people and, and, and the facility. And, and he said, when can you start? I said, Monday. And it was a Friday. And that day he gave me my shirts. And I basically started the very next uh, week. And that was the transition, man. Was It was just giving so much and being able to see what I was doing was positively influencing another another person and right. helping them achieve their goal, not expecting anything in return other yes. than just me wanting to see them transform. Because you know as well as I do, go to any gym across America, a lot of personal trainer clients look the same year after year after year after year. Absolutely. But here I come in and then I can start personal training, but I was also helping with the diet aspect and my clients were having tremendous transformations. And then that was also where the gym kind of caught lieu of what I was doing. And they're like, hey, William, we want to have a conversation with you. You know, number one, look, we respect how knowledgeable you are in like the diet and the, the body transformation and bodybuilding. He's like, but you're going to have to make a choice. You know, you're either going to be 100% Gold's Gym or you're not going to be Gold's Gym at all. So I had to make a choice. So there's there's a few things that um, I had to make notes of this because uh, I wanted it was so important that I wanted to circle back to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a quote that I want to tell you that I think goes along with a lot of what you just said. And then there's three very key points that I don't know if you even realize that you touched on that I think that if somebody is new to training or new to wanting to be a coach or a personal trainer or something that they need to hear, replay this and hear what you said. First of all, the quote, and listen, this is not 100% of how it goes, but it's the general gist of it, is that provides so much value that people cannot deny you. I've wow. always stood by that quote with my coaching, with my content creation, with as much as I possibly can. And you talked about working with like 15 people for free. And I did the same thing. I mean, I was working with people before I even started with Lane, right? And you have to be willing to put in the work and provide value without expecting anything back. That's how you actually move further ahead in life, right? So I wanted to talk to you about that quote and tell you that quote, because I think it goes perfect with what <clears throat> you were just saying. And then talking about your journey, there's three main points that I, I think that you brought up. Number one is you networked. You got in the gym, you networked with clients that weren't even your clients. You networked with trainers, all that stuff. So you you put yourself in the arena to begin with. Mm -hmm. You can't win the game if you're not even in the arena. Number mm -hmm. two is self-education. Now, you had education from college, but you were meticulous at going about studying research. And, and I'm sure you had a, a handful of people that you followed and were trying to gain knowledge from that were doing things the right way. So self-education. And then the third one, and I think this is the one that maybe holds people up the most, is you had the confidence to march into that general manager's office and say, I'm the best trainer in here, and I'm not even training anybody. Give me a shot. Mm -hmm. And those three things right there, I think will carry anybody anywhere in life. Now, are there going to be hiccups and obstacles? And, and you even talked about obstacles. Of course there is. But if you can't manage those three or get your head wrapped around those three points right there, 
you're never going to win. You're always yeah. going to be stuck or not even start to begin with. So I wanted to highlight that because that's such a powerful message. That's such a powerful message. And in the grand scheme of things, they're not difficult things to do. Mm. It's just people are either afraid, um, complacent, or or just don't have the confidence to actually go about doing them. So I applaud you for that, man. I appreciate it, man. You know, in in the word they call that humility. Yes. Right. It's 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 not being too good for anything. It's it's being able to provide value before you ever ask for a favor. You know what I mean? Um, and yes, to 100 percent agree with you, dude, I was just so hungry, man. You know, yeah. the only nutrition coach I knew about at that time when I was doing this was Lane. He was the mm -hmm. only guy that I knew that was actually doing it. And I was like, well, I'm not there yet, you know, but what can I do in the meantime to make sure that I'm actually showing up in this gym every day and I'm actually able to help somebody with something. And over the course of time, you know, it just became the fact that I had helped so many people that people started to say, well, hey, if you got a question, you got to ask the janitor. Um, and so, and so, you know, they would just come over and they, and we'd start talking and something that was really cool was the fact that like, and this goes really well into, I think what you what you just summarized there. But when I made the commitment on me to become yeah. the trainer, to become the coach, to become the prep coach, and I put my flyers up in that gym, you know, I was full within the first few months. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, a you lot of people that ended up, day. right, every single day. And, you know, again, like I was walking the walk. So, like, I'm training like a body daughter. I looked like a body daughter, you know. And, again, you just provide so much value to a, a facility. Who else in the facility provided that much value? They're not going to nobody else. They're going to you, right, because right. you positively influence and impact their life in a manner that they cannot forget. So I, I think that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you probably weren't even thinking this at the time, but you probably never thought of yourself as the janitor. You probably always thought of yourself as, I'm a trainer who just happens to be cleaning, right? So like you always, did you always have that mindset of like, listen, this is just a, this is just a side thing. This is to get me to where I want to get to. Like you yeah. have that confidence, right? That you were going to get to where you wanted to get to. I have... I guess you would say ever since I was a kid, I always believed that I could achieve anything that I wanted to as long as I was willing to work really hard. You know, um, and throughout my life, I would say that that's been my story is I just, I just outlast. I just stick with it. When it gets hard, I just keep going, you know, um, and I'll, I'll, Where does I'll, I'll tell you, oh man. Um, Your mom? Family? A lot's going to come from my mom. Um, love my mom to death. You know, I um, I watched her go through so many challenging things when I was a young boy that mm -hmm. I, I feel like she taught me resilience. She taught me strength. She taught me to never quit. And it was just by me watching her. You know, anybody who knew me back then, they know I didn't talk very much. I was very quiet. I had a speech impediment. I never spoke because I was scared that I would stutter and then I would get made fun of. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me to have a voice now, you know, it's like I spent my whole life being quiet. So now I have a voice and I want to use it. Um, but growing up, I was traumatized at a very young age. And so every time I would try to speak, the trauma controlled my voice, it controlled me. Um, okay. And so me being able to watch my, my mom go through the hardship of the divorce, uh, you know, uh, issues with my father, um, you know, losing her job, finding another job, working two jobs, um, and just all the things that she had to overcome. I didn't know what, what quitting was, man. I, I, she taught yeah. me so much and I'm so grateful for her today because I know, you know, without my mom and without my relationship with God, I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to push through a lot of the things that I've been through. So where does it come from? I think it comes from her. Um, yeah. You know, and ultimately, like, you know, again, I think about it. I think about all this as being like an athlete, right? Okay. So I've gone back in my life and I've kind of looked at the story. And the story was, you know, uh, so I played a little, little league football um, and 
I started as a peewee, which is like 11 or 12 years old, you know, and at the end of my peewee career, you know, I happened to make the Pinellas County All-Star team, which was great, which was a really cool accomplishment as like a 12 or 13 year old kid. Uh, But then we start high school, right? And we're stepping into new territory. There was... I think there was like 1,200 freshmen that started at maybe 2,000. It could have been 2,000. I was at a big 5A school. Um, So there might have been 2,000 freshmen, right? And when I think back, I'm like, man, only 350 of them graduated, right? Thank God I was one of the 350 that graduated. And then I think back, I'm like, you know, I'm like, how many of the all-stars on that little league team made it to the all-star team in high school? So I also happened to make the Pinellas County All-Star team as a high school senior. And then out of the nine football players that got football scholarships at my high school, my senior year, I was the only one that graduated college, right? And then just thinking about that, because I was always an athlete, right? So I'm like, if I just outlast, if I just show up and I show out and I try my best, I can never be stopped, you know? And when I think back to like three-a-day football practices and stuff, Dude, we would start three a days with 130 prime time athletes, right? We finished with 85. 45 of them packed their bags, head back home to mommy and their girlfriend, right? And it's like the ones who outlasted, the ones who could deal with it, the ones who were psychologically and physiologically strong enough to make it through, they lasted. You know what I mean? It's just been... I feel like looking back at my life, it's just been a phase of events where I just had to outlast people. Um, and when I, you know, I remember with the first person that ever, I remember talking to Lane, I, this was 13 years ago, man. This was, um, I just remember him saying like, never quit, you know, yeah. never quit. And that has stuck with me ever since, man. And, you know, I truly believe that if you put yourself in a position where you just don't ever quit, but you keep showing up and you keep trying. There's nothing that can break you. You know, it's eventually yeah. you'll get the opportunity. Eventually you'll get the award. You'll get the success. You'll get whatever you want as long as you just don't quit when it gets hard. So, man, I thank God for for my mom, mm-hmm. you know, the resilience that she had. Um, and I also have to be grateful for my grandfather because my mom learned a lot of her resiliency from my grandfather. Um, he, he was a, a Navy veteran uh, and actually uh, fought in World, World War II. Uh, so, you know, very, very strong man, uh, high morals, high integrity, very amazing life lessons that my grandfather passed on to my mother, whom which passed on to me. That's amazing. You you talked a little bit about um, a few minutes ago about you know, you going in at the ground level and learning and becoming a leader and nothing is beneath you. Right. And and that took me back to my military days. Right. Mm -hmm. So the best leaders that I had, the best officers that I knew, not saying, and and, and if some of them are listening to this, I'm not saying that all of them were bad, but some of the best ones that I had were ones that started enlisted and then became officers. Right. Because they knew the grunt work that we had to go through, the enlisted men had to go through. And that is such an important thing to really hone in on, because I think that that, that along with your resilience, your faith in God, the lessons that your mother learned from a military father, right, has molded you into this, this man who has such an incredible gift of knowledge, compassion, empathy, but also knows how to push, right? Like you don't give up. And that is a huge theme that I've picked up from you and that I've known about you for a long time. And it doesn't surprise me that God has put you through these challenges in your life because he knows you can handle it. And and I want to kind of touch briefly on, because you and I are both men of faith. We believe in God. When did that come into your whole realm of being has that been something that your mom instilled is that something that you found later on in life and and how does that help guide you as a coach and as a husband and as a father you know what i've uh i think I, i i witnessed some things at a very early age in my life and 
by witnessing these things, ultimately, I just kind of had to, I needed to make a choice, you know, um, I, I, I knew what was right and what was wrong at a very young age. Um, for me, um, one of the events was, you know, and lo looking back at it now, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that my mom survived it. Um, I'm so grateful that, um, you know, I was, I gained a perspective to respect women, to respect my mother, to, you know, to be with her, to, you know, be a support for her. Because, you know, in all honesty, the way that I saw it as a two and a half year old boy in which I'll say this, um, you know, a lot of time parents say, oh, they're only three years old, four years old, five years old. They're not going to remember that later on in life. Right. You know, I remember watching my father almost kill my mother in front of me at two and a half years old. And in that moment, I had to protect my sister. And I, you know, I remember running into her bedroom, pulling her out of her crib and going and hiding under the kitchen table while my mom and my dad were fighting. Um, and in that moment, number one, when you say compassion, empathy, I think that's where I learned it was mm -hmm. I learned in that moment at two and a half years old what I never wanted to be. And mm -hmm. then I also learned that I needed to be a protector. Yep. I needed to be the support. You know, and um, it, and that's that's how I see it now. Is I I I still need to be the support, and the support for anything needs to be strong. You know, right. the support for anything needs to have a firm foundation, because you could essentially ensure that if you're if you're anchored to something that's firm, even when the hurricanes come, the boat will not leave the harbor. Right? Absolutely. It is. It is. Absolutely. It is there. Um, and so going through that, I think helped, helped teach me a lot. Um, and my faith in God, I think also came probably around, I was probably six or seven years old. Um, mm -hmm. again, I was traumatized. Uh, and so I didn't have a voice. I was scared to stutter. I couldn't talk. And I just remember one day I was going through a hard time and, you know, this is when like, just the wrong thoughts are flooding your mind. It's the devil trying to break through, right? It's the devil trying to get to you, trying to sabotage your mind, trying to get you to make the wrong choices. And yeah. I think I was only seven years old, David, and I jumped on my bike and I just remember riding to the park that was close to my house. And I just started praying to God. I'd never heard of God before. I never heard, I, ne I didn't know anybody who went to church. I was never in a church, nothing. I just, dear God, you know, and I just started praying praying for my mom, praying for our family, praying for myself, just yeah. asking for things and, and all of that. And in that moment, I realized, like, I believe it gave me the strength to go on, you know. Absolutely. And every time I felt like I was in a challenging spot, I would just go pray. Um, and then there was another instance that occurred later on in my life where I thought this was going to be the thing that broke me. But it, it wasn't. Um, I was 14 years old. Um, I blew my ACL and shattered both my meniscuses as a 14 year old high school freshman. And wow. everybody's telling me, they were like, dude, hang it up, man. You're done. Like, you're never going to oh, play yeah. football again. You know, because I was, I, I would have been starting on varsity as a 13, 14 year old kid. Um, and like, they're like, dude, just hang it up. You're done. You're never going to play football again. And I said, no, I mean, this is my identity. This is who I am. I'm an athlete. I'm a football player. I'm going to play again. And um, so I ha had to rehab and recover for the next like eight to 10 months. You know, mm -hmm. I went through, you know, a lot of depression in that moment. Didn't know who I was, wanted to change schools. I wasn't yeah. doing what I thought I was good at. So I kind of lost who I was. Um, and then you finish up high school, you know, never kind of maybe returning to the best that you could have been, but the best that you're capable of, given the fact that, um, you know, doctor clipped your hamstring tendon and basically you've been operating on one hamstring tendon for the next three years. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I just, I just always realize I'm like, I just got dealt the cards I got dealt and I just got to keep going. It just is what it is. And granted, there's so many people that had it way worse. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, dude, if, if people have had it way worse, like I know it's possible. 
Um, and then I blew and my knee great. out again as a freshman in college, blew it out again as a junior in college. And I just kept coming back, David, you know? Um, yeah. So again, like if you look at the, the, the path of my life, even another story that I could dive into where I was attacked and I almost, I could have died if my friends wouldn't have gotten me to the hospital in time. Um, there's just so many things that add up. And it's like, if I could get through that, I can get through anything. And there's nothing that's going to stop me. Um, there, so I think that that's where it comes from as far as that confidence. That perspective of, and I think it's really important because I think that when we get caught up in situations where it's very easy to fall, uh, feel sorry for ourselves, right? We always have to keep yeah. in mind the blessings that we have in our life and that mm -hmm. there is always somebody that has it worse. And now some people might say like, oh, that's a horrible way to look at it. But I think that's a very necessary way to look at it because it puts things in perspective. And life is all about perspective. It, it's about how are you going to view this moment? How are you going to view this adversity and move on from that? Now, yeah. you talked about a little bit ago, um, at I think you said three or something, you know, witnessing your, your mom and your dad and having to get your sister out and everything like that. And you are that anchor you are that support that protector i see it i see it with you with your family like i i see that in you that is just who you are but even protectors even anchors need an anchor and mm. that's where i think god really came into your life because there is no greater anchor than god mm -hmm. there, there is nothing yeah there. when you are the tree that everybody anchors to right mm -hmm. that tree needs to be anchored to something and that's why there's roots in the ground. And that's what I think that God came into your life and really, really <clears throat> gave you this gift of perspective. Because I, I've never had a knee injury. <laughs> I've never done anything like that. Um, I would like to think that I would respond the same way you would. And maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. You don't know until you're in that position. But when you have that solid anchor, when you have your your upbringing, when you have that faith in God, when you have those experiences that you've overcome, it gives you that strength to keep moving on. And I didn't know about the three knee injuries with you. I never knew about that. I think I knew about one of them, but I don't think I knew about the other ones. Um, but having that gift of perspective, I think is, is really valuable as a coach too, in what you're doing now, because yes, we talked about empathy and compassion and all that too, but you have the ability to bring a unique perspective to your clients when they're going through their own adversity, right? I mean, you've injuries. We, we both deal with clients with injuries all the time, right? It's just a part of working out. It's a part of, you know, being health, being healthy, but I mean, working out in the gym and trying to get healthy and stuff. So you having that firsthand knowledge of what you did to come back from an injury and how your mindset was and stuff, that's invaluable to, towards a client. You know, you talked about earlier, um, you know, in the gym at gold and, you looking the part and showing up as the part. Well, now you've got that coupled with actually going through adversity. And that's an, un, that's an unstoppable combination as a coach. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree, agree there. Um, and, you know, again, to express a level of humility, um, you know, it's like, I am still growing as a, as, as a man, you know, I'm still growing as a man of faith. As a husband, as a, as a father, um, you know, Lord knows I make mistakes every day. You know, but it's not about a lot of mistakes that I make to define me. It's right. being able to learn from the mistakes and not allow them to define who I am or who I'm becoming. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, I think it, it does, in my opinion, I think it does take a lot to be able to, to call yourself out. But I think ultimately, if you're on a path to personal development and personal growth, you have to be able to call yourself out because in all honesty, nobody else is going to, you know, like well, to actually be able else. to sit back and reflect on what are you doing? What could you have done better? And having reflection time on a daily or weekly basis, I think it's pivotal because ultimately, like what I don't want is any of my paths to you know, breathe, breathe into my children, the negative stuff to breathe into my children. So there has to be a mother and a father that at some point in the lineage of the family can basically grow and develop into such higher versions of what they came from that they are basically leaving all the bad behind and 
only depositing so much of the good moving forward. But this is where I feel like I currently am now, still moving through it myself and ultimately right. just trying to become the best man that I can before, you know, before my days are over. Well, you, you are changing the course of your family. Like you That's are the, the one. expectation, but I have yeah. high expectations. <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, even just, you know, I, I see you with your kids and I see you, you know, being a father first, that's always going to be the most important thing to you. And I, I know that from you and that. just knowing, you know, how, how your history was with your dad and, and growing up and stuff, you are, you're, you're providing an excellent leadership and role model for those kids moving forward. And you guys are doing it. You guys are doing an amazing job. And <clears throat> um, I wanted to kind of transition into a little bit more nutrition and training talk now that we've kind okay, of established sure. who you are, where you came from, because all of that is important to, you know, understand how you go about working with your clients and your whole perspective mm-hmm. moving forward and your education, your background, because you are an evidence-based coach. You mm-hmm. are someone that believes in science, mm-hmm. but you also have the perspective of understanding that everybody's an individual and mm-hmm. you're going to have to adapt science to that individual. I always, I always tell my clients, like, listen, we're going to use evidence-based approaches when it's necessary and when it, when it's applicable, but we're going to have to take science and take you and mesh you together because there is no perfect plan, right? There is no perfect training program, perfect diet plan because everybody lives different lifestyles. Everybody's an N of one. And I know you approach your clients like that too. So talk to me a little bit about your strategies when approaching somebody with wanting to go into a fat loss phase? What are some of the things that you want to talk to them about first? What are some of the things you want to know? And then how do you go about general strategies in terms of getting them to effective fat loss safely and not just crash dieting them? Because we all know that most of society just thinks about slashing calories and adding a bunch of cardio. You and I know different. How do you get that through to your clients? Yeah, so let's go ahead and let's turn on the exercise science coach hat here. Um, yep. So I think the most important thing that a lot of people need to understand is that you have to build a really solid foundation of lean body mass in order to have a really successful fat loss phase, in my opinion. Right? Mm-hmm. And so what do we essentially need to do to set somebody up? I think it takes, number one, making sure you can maximize their lifestyle make sure they're living a proactive life, making sure they're trying their best to optimize their sleep quality and just, again, living a proactive life, not a reactive life, a high stress life, all that kind of stuff. Making sure that they have their, their you know, daily exercise kind of dialed in. You know, they're not with a bunch of roller coasters, like 1,000 steps, 10,000 steps, 2,000, 13,000, but just having a standardized level of activity across the board. Uh, making sure that they are training in a manner that suits their goals. So maybe their goal is to be able to build muscle and build strength. Are they training in a manner that's allowed them to progressive overload, you know, over the course of maybe the last four to six months or longer, depending on how much skeletal muscle mass somebody wants to build. And then the other thing that is probably the biggest problem in our nutritional coaching space is just chronic low calorie dieters. I mean, you know, when we're talking about trying to build a solid foundation of lean body mass, we have to be able to feed the organism what it needs to be able to start to grow and develop and basically compound over time, right? Think about it like building a house. You lay the foundation and then you slowly start to stack the bricks up. But it takes time to do that no matter how you do it. It's going to take time to be able to reach that point where stress is under control, lifestyle is under control. You've built more muscle than you probably ever have, and you're stronger than you've ever been. And you haven't intentionally tried to diet yourself for a prolonged period of time, at least until your hormonal profile is optimal and you're remaining, in my opinion, you know, insulin sensitive, eating a good amount of calories. I think right. in and of itself, in that moment, you're probably in a good position to start a fat loss phase. But your mindset also needs to be able to quickly turn on, turn off. Otherwise, if you're living in the past of low calorie diet, moving more and training every single day is the only way to get in shape. It's going to be very hard for an evidence-based coach to actually help you build muscle 
So I think you have to be able to turn on the ability to be thinking about the things that I just listed, because ultimately those are the things that are going to make you the strongest version of yourself, which is going to set you up for the most successful fat loss phase you've probably ever had. Absolutely. And, you know, we live in a society full of patience, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody, people are listening to this. They're like, yeah, that sounds good. Well, that's great, great, great. I just want to start dieting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, mm -hmm. you brought up actually two things that I was going to hit later on, but I think I will say this. I think successful yeah. fat loss is earned. Mm. I like that. I mean, it's true. I, I get I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, that's 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 a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. You um, you touched on a couple of things, like I said, that I was going to bring up later on. But this is just a perfect transition into it. You talked about hormones. And you talked about insulin resistance. Right. Well, mm -hmm. you talked about insulin sensitivity, but I'm mm -hmm. going to go with the insulin resistance route. Mm -hmm. um, you're really big on this, and, and you, for years, have done videos and content on blood work and the importance of it and optimizing hormones and all this stuff. Um, what are some of the things that you see generally as people are, are coming to you and inquiring about coaching, is there something from a hormonal basis or deficiency that you see a lot of people experiencing or is it very, is it very individual? Like, is there any sort of common theme amongst people that you're working with? Like almost everybody is vitamin D deficient or almost everybody's got thyroid issues, anything like that. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll mention this because I think it's important to highlight because I think maybe people look at like where I am now and they're like, oh, it's maybe genetics or, you know, family, whatever. Uh, my whole family was overweight. My whole family was insulin resistant. My whole family, like the women in my family, type 2 diabetes. And yeah. as I was going through academia, learning more about blood sugar, learning more about building muscle, losing body fat, insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, I realized – about the time that my about the time that my son was born, which is about seven years ago, um, that I could actually help my own mom. Now my mom had type two diabetes since I was a kid, so I had to yeah. watch her inject insulin, right? Uh, take metformin usually multiple times a day, um, and but nobody ever addressed her diet. Nobody ever addressed her lifestyle. She worked a desk job. She didn't move very much. Ate ate food. Right. And she was near 300 pounds, I think, at her biggest, maybe 280 or something a lot like that. But she had worked with a doctor for like, you know, I mean, heck, like seven, eight years. And they had never once brought up her lifestyle or her diet. And I remember Which when surprising because doctors, they only have like three or six hours of nutrition throughout their mm -hmm. whole training. Yeah, and you're talking. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking, you're growing up, you're talking 30 years ago also. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, about seven sense. years ago, I called my mom up and I was like, hey, mom, like, I would really like to be able to help help you here. Because at the mm -hmm. time, I think she had just passed like 60 years old. Uh, we had my son, which then that means she had at the time four grandkids. Now she's got five, five grand, six, six grandkids. And we just had to have, have the real talk, David. I'm like, do you yeah. want to be around to watch them grow up? Because based off of all the things I know regarding insulin resistance, whether it be type type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you are cutting your life short if you don't 100%. gain glycemic control, right? And then so let I me, say – Let me stop well, you real quick because I, I sure, think people ahead. are probably thinking, well, what, is, what do they mean by insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity? Can mm -hmm. you – can you? Yeah. I want you to finish your story, but I want people to get have context of like what we're talking about with this. Yeah, so there are numerous things that can influence whether you're insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. But for the, the general population that's watching this, basically, if I go and I do a blood glucometer test, basically, you could just buy them on Amazon and you can check it in the safety of your own home. You don't have to go see a doctor. But if I check to see how much blood sugar you have present at that specific moment in time, it will give me a number. And I typically like to check fasted first thing in the morning, just as an introduction to learning more about your blood sugar. Um, but, um, you know, an insulin resistant individual would be, or what they term as free diabetes would be anything like 98, 99, a hundred, you know, 105, 110, 115, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, where they would start to get a cause for concern is if you're like 120 or higher, they'd be like, okay. you know, you're, you're approaching a, a diabetic state, um, insulin sensitivity is anything roughly 70 
up to about, I'd say, 85, 90, which is a more than desirable place where you should live most of the time. Um, you also have sub under 70, but that's more re referred to as a uh, hypoglycemia. So you've mm -hmm. probably heard people that maybe when they're training really hard and they're dieting for shows, they can get light lightheaded because their blood sugar drops under 70, right? And you okay. kind of have to keep a stable blood sugar level. So in terms of the big picture of insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, it basically just tells you like how much circulating blood sugar, blood glucose do you have at that specific moment in time? And the reason I like to check it first thing in the morning as an introduction to learning about this is because in many cases, you just got done fasting for about eight hours. So that's right. giving you a fairly accurate representation of what your blood sugar is doing first thing in the morning. And um, after you eat, right, it's natural for your, your blood sugar to go up. So that's why you don't yep. really want it. It's not really a, it's not really a true indication. However, it can still be very beneficial to know what it is there and then how long it takes to get back down to baseline after. Correct. Two or three yeah. Hours. So that if can you're... tell you a huge amount of, of, you know, how insulin sensitive or insulin resistant you are as well. Correct. Yeah. So in order to accurately uh, actually say, I guess I'm insulin resistant, you would need to check your blood sugar. You need to check your insulin levels. You'd also need to check your A1C levels. Those mm -hmm. three will tell you whether or not you're insulin resistant. Now, depending on the foods that you choose to eat, there is a very minimal glycemic response when it comes to dietary fats. There's mm -hmm. also a very minimal glycemic response when it comes to dietary proteins, unless you decide to eat something that maybe has some trace carbohydrates or it's like a patent protein powder or something like that, because yeah. there is a glycemic response to protein. But there's a very minimal glycemic response to animal-based proteins and fats. So if you decide to eat a carbohydrate-filled meal, let's just call it you dose 50 grams of carbohydrate, you should see a glycemic response. You would have, uh, you know, your body would re release insulin out of the pancreas, and essentially that insulin is used to then shuttle those nutrients into the cell. Um, and then after that's over with, you should, your blood sugar should resort back to your baseline, which is typically pretty close to what it was first thing in the morning unless the individual was dealing with something called the dawn phenomenon, which is essentially, you know, when people wake up and they're in chaos and they're in stress, right? Yeah. That can cause a higher number first thing in the morning. But also the thing you have to consider is that when sunlight hits the optic nerve, that releases sugar to basically get you up and get you going, right? This mm -hmm. is why cortisol levels are typically always higher first thing in the morning. And it's, kind of rolls in line with a normal circadian response. So a normal circadian response is, well, cortisol is high in the morning, it gets you up, it gets you going, and then it tapers off throughout the day so you can naturally get ready to sleep and then do it all over again. Um, and so if you decide to dose carbohydrate, you know, call it 50 grams of carbohydrate at breakfast, after about two, three, three and a half hours, you should see that, that spike you might go from like an 80 fasted, maybe up to like close to 100, maybe 105 or something, depending on what kind of carb you eat. Um, because high glycemic and low glycemic, they can, they can make a difference. Uh, yeah. The fiber intake of the meal can also make a difference in terms of what ends up happening. Um, but ideally, and if you're you should return that back to protein or fat, that'll also change the glycemic index a little bit. For it's sure. So this is like macronutrient stacking yeah of course yeah. like we are advocates of energy balance we're advocates of calories in calories out total energy balance but i just had to learn inside of the intricacies for my own mom because i right. wanted to help her right so i'm like well, what's what would be the best thing to help her get her type 2 diabetes under control number one it was the mind game of type 2 diabetes is not a disease that you are determined to have for the rest of your life Absolutely. You can control it if you change some of these things. And David, man, when I tell you, like, my mom was regimented. She's regimented. Maybe yeah. that comes from my father, my, my, my grandpa, because he was in the military. I, I can imagine. Right? But, like, yeah. if I ask her, hey, eat this for breakfast, eat this for lunch, eat this for dinner, she'll do it, and she'll be consistent. So I actually started her off on a ketogenic-style diet when we first okay. started, right, because I've learned from – Dr. Andrew Paul Kutnick, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, you know, and yeah. all the research that they've done at the University of South Florida, 
And I implemented that into working with my mom. And after about six months, my mom had lost a considerable amount of weight. We're talking like 60 pounds, you know. And I said, hey, mom, like, I think it's time for you to add in some carbohydrate back into your diet just to make sure that we can, you know, try to keep your metabolism as healthy as we can. So let's just go ahead and let's just add in maybe like one carbohydrate, high carbohydrate day per week or something like that. You know? Right. Um, and so we did that. And David, my mom ended up losing over 100 pounds. And we are here four years later, and she is still down the 100 pounds. Right. That's awesome. Because she – and now she – she was using a lot of money per month in insulin. Now I think she uses a tenth of that in insulin. And then she was also using metformin. Now she regulates her blood sugar with her diet. But if she ever wants to, you know, indulge a little bit more or something like that, obviously she'll counterbalance that. But, um, you know, we were able to do that predominantly with just altering her lifestyle and her food choices and her habits. So, you know, when people ask me, like, how did you learn about this? I was trying to save mom. Like, I just wanted to learn about it. So I wanted to save mom, you know, yeah. and, and it hits um, close to home. You, you, you yeah. take a much bigger uh, interest in it for sure. Do you remember yeah. um, when you first started working with your mom? Do you remember what her fasting blood glucose level was? So the scary part, David, was that my mom called me one day and said she had a blood sugar attack, right? Which basically means her blood sugar shot up to over 600. Jeez. Okay? Now, inside of this happening, she also popped some blood vessels in her eyes, so she lost vision in one of her eyes because of the, because of the glycemic, because of the blood sugar response, yeah. right? And so that, that, was, that was the need for the call. Hey, what do we want to do here? You know, I can help you, but we need to get this under control as fast as possible. Yeah. Um, and I, she spiked up to over 600. And then now I think she maintains something in like the 130 to 150 range. Okay. Whereas before she was maintaining something in like the 300 range. Okay. Um, and if you, you know, again, if you take into consideration the research that we have available on longevity and glycemic control, even though her blood sugar isn't perfect, it's way yeah. better than what it was, you know. So does she implement like regular exercise? as well just um, walking that. just walking just walking and that yeah that's really important to highlight is that it doesn't take much effort to mm. maintain a, a healthier lifestyle right like people think you have to be in the gym five or six days a week and you just you don't have to i mean it yes it, it's good and you know if you have specific bodybuilding goals and things like that but just regular movement, getting out, walking. I mean, you live in Florida. She lives in Florida. There's always an opportunity to get out and moving. And so a lot, the, the barrier of entry to good health is very low. It is very yeah. low. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I will control. say that your, your lifestyle is, you know, and if you're dealing with insulin resistance, chances are your lifestyle is absolutely the biggest lever that you can pull to start to make yeah. changes to, to improve your blood sugar. Um, but also like, you know, just be open to the idea that food is medicine. Like we can transform yeah. the health of our physiology by manipulating food. Um, and that's part of the reason why I named our company the educated dieter is because if you think about like, what is an educated dieter? It's like, I just know what tools to use at the right time, you know, and we have all these available tools on our tool belt to be able to use. And in some specific cases, people know me as a macro coach right? Or a bodybuilding coach or a health coach, right? Nobody would ever think I'd ever use keto, but I did for a specific yeah. case because it's an end of one thing. Now, granted, yeah. could I, could I have had her just track her macros and achieve something similar? Probably. Maybe. It's possible. Um, keto, but keto I also, also wanted her to get the weight off as fast as possible. You know what I mean? And I needed to solve that problem now. I didn't need to I didn't need to wait two months, three months, whatever. And I knew that she was so far gone that I had to do something relatively drastic in order just to get her back to baseline as fast as I could. You know what I mean? So um it's a tool. It it's a tool and you know, as much as we uh we preach you know, a, a sustainable conservative approach to dieting. The simple fact is, is that life is not as simple as just ABC. Like there's, 
your mom's case, I've had cases where people were, yes, you have to get a little bit more drastic, but you do it, you do it strategically with an end game in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Your goal was absolutely never to be with her and keep her there forever. Like there are some things that supersede um, evidence based approaches, and what I mean by that is like her her health and everything was in jeopardy. You needed to get weight down. You needed to get her blood glucose levels down. You needed to do right. that stuff. And when you're dealing with somebody who's you said she was almost three hundred pounds, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, not a big woman height wise. That that is life threatening, right there. And so what do you, what do you think is going to be worse, you know, doing a little bit more of a, an aggressive approach to get that down and get her healthy and then work on those habits or keeping her at that weight and going slow and still just kind of naturally killing herself. Like that's just, there's no question in my mind. Like it's a tool. Keto is a tool. Um, you know, low carb diets in general are a tool. You're not dogmatic about any approach. You're with the approach that's going to be appropriate for that client at that time. But you always keep the end goal in mind, which I really appreciate about you. You're you're never just like, hey, we're going to get you down here and then good luck. Like you're on your own. I know yeah. that you know the way that we coach and I coach is that you're you're thinking about multiple phases down the road, mm-hmm. right? Like with your mom, you were thinking about just getting her healthy first, and then how do we sustain that? That's the next term. That's the next phase. With people who are dieting that just want to drop some body fat, right? And improve their physique. Well, that's a whole different way of dieting than what you did with your mom. But you're also thinking about, okay, then what do we need to do afterwards to sustain that? Right? Because oh, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, as, any. Oh, I was going to say, as much as we know about science and research and, and keeping the metabolism healthy and stuff along the way, the fact is, is dieting is still dieting. Like it is, you're mm-hmm. going to be hungry. You're going to get mm-hmm. lower in calories. The the thing that people lose track of is that you don't stay there. You don't stay yeah. there long term. And that's right. what ends up screwing people up in the long term. It's just like that mindset of like, oh, man, I can't even just add a little bit of food in or I'm going to blow back up to that 20 or 25 pounds that I just lost. And that's not sim- that's simply just not the case. Right. But yeah. you mentioned something with your mom and, you know, you talked about, um, you know, lifestyle and changing that a little bit. I think one of the first things you said was she had to get in her mind that a change needed to be made, right? That yeah, she could not absolutely. keep going the same way. And I find a lot of times with clients, that's the hardest piece of the puzzle right there is that first mm-hmm. initial, like, okay, admit or come to come to terms with what you're doing right now is not working for your long-term goals. And mm-hmm. if you can overcome that, if you can kind of come to reality with that, the sky's the limit with what you can do. But that mindset change is so tough for people. Yeah, you know, I like to say that not every season is a fat loss season. And when I tell people that, they're like, what do you mean? Because I've only ever tried fat loss diets before. I'm like, well, the fact that you're coming here, you're talking to me, chances are you saw one of my videos where, you know, I talked about, you know, stop dieting, rebuild your metabolism, metabolic adaptation. Chances are you've probably seen one of those at some point in time. And maybe at the time it didn't make sense, but then you don't really understand until you're actually going through the process of not dieting right um but in my mom's case and for anybody that has because you know david there's a lot of people out there that have lost the weight before they've lost the 50 70 80 100 pounds before and then they've regained it Mm -hmm. right plus some more and and so i know that by helping you know probably a handful of people now lose over 100 pounds that what we're actually doing is we're telling them the end in the beginning. Mm. Yep. Because a lot of the time, the diets that they have tried, there is no end. It's just a template. Here, do this and you'll lose weight. Yeah, if I take somebody with a maintenance of 2,300, 2,400 calories, I put them on 1,200, you think they're going to lose fat? I think they're going to oxidize fat? Yeah, of course. But can they actually sustain that, that 1,200 calorie intake into eternity? No, and they shouldn't. Right. So we have to actually plan ahead. We have to implement maybe some things like diet breaks, create transitional processes to say, hey, look, you just lost 20 pounds. How do you feel? Oh, you know, I'm starting to feel a little ran down. Great. Phenomenal opportunity for us to just apply a diet break for about five Mm -hmm. to seven days. Let's recharge the batteries and then let's push for the next 10 to 20 pounds. 
right? Absolutely. And so for a lot of the times, the cases that I'm working with that need to lose 50 to 100 pounds, we're doing that. We're basically doing the matador style approach, mm -hmm. but we're flexible with it, right? One to three weeks in a deep calorie deficit to oxidize, mobilize fatty acids. And then right. maybe one to two weeks in a diet break to basically help recharge them. And then we just keep it going. And the transitional process out of this has been tremendous because most of the time they're not suffering from, let's just say the heavier client, they're not suffering from the metabolic adaptations that we would see from people that are trying to get stage lean or get yeah. photo shoot lean or something. You know, so in most cases, as long as they're moving, they're eating a healthy diet, they're eating enough calories, like you can keep them healthy. And you can just start melting off a lot of that extra body fat. But the thing that they've never had is a intentional interrupt in the mm -hmm. low calories to basically recharge the batteries and keep going. And for the people that we've had lose a considerable amount of weight, that's normally what we end up doing is telling them about these phases, telling them about the end and how we're going to transition out of the end. Because again, most people reach the end and they have no plan, they have no structure, they have no continued support, they have no continued coaching because the plan that they got was just a regurgitated cookie cutter diet that they got from somebody else where the coach yeah. didn't actually strategize after. And it's like it's like giving it's like giving somebody who's broke a bunch mm -hmm. of money, but not teaching them mm -hmm. how to budget or how to sustain mm -hmm. that money, right? They're gonna be yep. broke again. It's the same thing with mm -hmm. dieting. You get them down, you give them that cookie cutter plan, you slash their calories. Yes, they're going to lose weight. They're also going to yeah. lose probably a lot of muscle along the way, which mm -hmm. is going to hurt their metabolism in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're not going to know how to sustain that. And we kind of call it the plan after the plan, right? Like there's yes, always the plan. Correct. There's always going to be a plan after the plan, whether that is you're going through fat loss and then the plan is to reverse diet up a little bit and maintain, or, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to re you're going to reverse diet up, get healthy. And then you plan on going doing fat loss after, or you maintain, I think so many people, and I actually just talked to um, Sarah Bishop about this yesterday on, on the Ooh. podcast, it's going to come out. And we talked about how maintenance is a phase that people forget. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think that, and she brought up a really good point with this is that I think the people that are afraid of just staying at maintenance, like they're always either trying to gain or trying to lose. And it's because maybe, maybe it's a societal thing where if you're not progressing towards something, you're thought of as lazy, you know, not driven, you're not, you're just not progressing, right? And we as a society, and as human beings, we have a hard time with that concept that like, okay, I'm not moving forward, right? Especially if you're like a type A personality, right? You're always wanting to move forward. But having that plan after the plan is so vital. And you talked about throwing in diet breaks. And I was part of the study with Campbell that we looked at diet breaks and we looked at, are they superior to fat loss or just consistently dieting? And the fact is, is that they're not really superior to fat loss in terms of retention of lean body mass or anything like that. But the point that you made was huge is that most people get mentally worn down from the dieting process. And all it does is it gives you, it's recharging your batteries, right? So maybe, maybe it extends the dieting period another couple of weeks. Who cares in the long run? If you're not... This is for people who are not competing, right? Because, I mean, if you're competing, you have a hard deadline, you have things that you need to hit. For most people, it's not really even a weight number that they're shooting for. It's a feel. It's a look. Mm -hmm. It's an energy level. So having these tools in our toolbox and utilizing it and dieting smarter, being educated while we're dieting, um, that's been a game changer. And that's what I think the value of an evidence-based coach brings is knowing how to take your physiological symptoms that you're experiencing, right? And what you're telling them and knowing how to probe and ask the right questions to determine, okay, is this a valuable time for you to actually just take a pause in your dieting or is pushing it another couple of weeks going to maybe start this cascading effect of where you're not going to be able to sustain it. You're going to start binge eating. You're going to start losing all your progress. And having that, having those tools and that plan is crucial. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, you can take it ways deeper than that too, but from a psychological perspective, I think all the things that we utilize in evidence-based coaching, you know, like high carb days, multiple day refeeds, short yeah. breaks, you know, diet breaks and creating diet periodization, if 
if you will. Mm, yeah. um, it just yeah. allows the client to stick to it and adhere to it for a longer duration of time without essentially feeling burned out. Now, I also think that it can be very beneficial for the hormonal profile of, you know, maybe an athlete or somebody going through a fat loss phase or something like that, because you can momentarily boost, you know, these things back up. Um, you know, as far as if you just kept them on a very low calorie diet, you may not be able to do that. And I, I believe that there's going to be more potential for metabolic adaptation if you don't use these strategies than if you do. Um, you know, and so I know we were talking a bit, a bit about like blood sugar, stuff like that. And we kind of went into losing a lot of weight and insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity. And hopefully by me just kind of sharing that story, people can kind of learn why I decided to dive deeper into this. But, yeah. you know, it didn't stop with blood sugar. Like it started just going into hormonal profiles and you know, metabolic adaptation. And specifically, what does metabolic adaptation look inside of this of this thing? Right? right, because people can say like, "Oh, look, person's in great shape," right? But I've seen so many people in great shape, David, that have a hypothyroidism and don't even know it. You know, yep. they got high stress, they don't even know it, right? Their progesterone levels for the, the calming hormone for the female physiology, progesterone is like a point two, point three, point four. They don't even know it, right? It's just like, look at how good I look. But it's like internally, you're a mess. Like we need yeah. to fix that. And then I think we can find a really nice balance between health and aesthetics. Um, and that's what I've been very interested in probably over the last like five years is getting people to be able to understand that, hey, we can improve your health, but also mm -hmm. we can work towards these aesthetic goals because you know as well as I do, like in the sport of bodybuilding, which is that's where that's the sport I come from, right? right. It was always just about you know, get as big as I can, eat as much as I can, get as strong as I can, and then shred down and get as lean as I can. So I would just fluctuate between like a 30 pound place. Mm -hmm. And when I was done bodybuilding, I'm like, why am I 210 pounds again? Yeah. It's really not serving it, you know? a good purpose at that point. Yeah, exactly. And um, I would even like at some times, this is really when I decided to take a lot of this, you know, power back was, you know, I actually ended up one time like kind of reverse dieting myself into insulin resistance. I was eating so much food. I wasn't moving enough. I wasn't exercising hard enough. And I was just going through a very stressful time. Uh, sleep quality was lack, lackluster. And I remember one day I was in the office. I checked, checked my blood sugar and I'm like 135. Oh, wow. Dude, I, was, I was like seeing, I was seeing stars in the sky. Dude, I'm like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is not normal. And I am not going to be, uh, you know, an insulin using diabetic like other people in, in, in my family. And that's right. kind of where like a lot of this stuff started was just because I was going through it too. Um, and so we can go whatever direction you want, man, but hopefully that provided some valuable context for your audience. Yeah, no, that was, that was huge. And giving that example of your mom, I appreciate you, you know, opening up about that because I think a lot of people yeah. are maybe, maybe they're not pushing 300 pounds, but they have similar lifestyle similar thoughts similar issues they're going for yeah um, i see that a lot honestly, now yeah and honestly i think that's actually a pretty good place to end right here um but i do want to i do want to um ask you i do this with my guests and i think it's a it's fun to hear what the answers are and it's <laughs> yeah. I think very valuable for people um just as motivation inspiration helping them with their journey and stuff moving forward but if there's been a quote in your life that has been powerful for you, whether in your past or currently, that you want to provide and pass on to other people, what would that quote be? Wow. I know. Has to, you be one, has to be one quote. Um, I think a lot of it just really boils down to the, the anchor. You know, mm -hmm. being the anchor in your life, like what are your anchors in your life, holding strong to those things, no matter what life throws at you. But yeah. then that also ties into the idea of ever quitting, right? Yeah. Because there's going to be times that there's going to be hard times. There's going to be things that come your way. Like everybody listening to this knows we've all gone through very challenging times. For sure. And the the reality is we know that inside of the darkness the light is going to come we just have to be resilient enough to maintain you know a sense of i guess maintain our anchor 
in the harbor until the sun shines again. Um, so maybe you're going through a dark time right now. Maybe you're going through some struggles, but just know, just keep showing up, keep showing up, and the sun's going to come again, and the water's going to calm down. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. And you're a perfect example of that, man. I mean, we we went through many examples of that in your life, and you're shining, and you're a shining light for your family, for your clients, for the community. Um, so if you guys are not following Will, um, shame on you. Um, where can they find you? <laughs> Where can they find you if they are new to uh, to you? Yeah, sure. So uh, Instagram, at William mm-hmm. underscore Grazion. I'm out, I am on Facebook as well. I'm on YouTube as well. Uh, we're actually getting ready to restart our, our podcast, Coach David. So I would love to have nice. you on our show. Um, we've got about, got about 100 episodes of an old podcast called Hey Coach Radio. We're going to be rebranding that to the Educated Dieter Show. Uh, and obviously David will be on there. So y'all can check that out. But um, those would be that. the best places to find us, uh, theeducateddieter.com. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate you for having me on, David. I appreciate you asking some pretty deep questions. And, um, you know, sometimes it's it's nice to be able to reflect on things like that because yeah. you kind of go through your day to day and you don't really sit down and think about them. And right. the fact that you can have a conversation with somebody that, you know, number one is very intelligent. Number two, ask good questions. Um, it does allow a bit of reflection to occur on behalf of the person being interviewed. So I gratefully appreciate you. I'm grateful for our friendship, and I hope that this show takes off. I appreciate that, man. Such kind words. And guys, I will put all of Will's information in the description below. I'll have links, everything. So go check him out. Give him a follow. He is an amazing coach. A uh, very caring man, man of God, and thank you again, Will. Um, next time I'm down in Florida, man, we'll have to get together for lunch, all right? You got it, brother. I appreciate you. God bless you and your family, and enjoy that land out there, bud. Thank you. Thank you.